I got lost on the way back. Starting off the news this week, astronomers have detected a very odd set of radio waves originating from near the center of our galaxy, and they've been unable to yet discern exactly what they are, having already pretty much ruled out more mundane sources like stars. The signal was detected a few times during 2020, with it last being detected in September 2020. The astronomers first thought they had detected something like a pulsar or a star emitting huge solar flares. However, further scrutinization of the data showed that it didn't match up with what is believed about these events. It doesn't even line up with a relatively new class of cosmic objects called galactic center radio transients, of which there is also very little known. There have been attempts to find the source through other means, for example it was searched for on the visual light spectrum, but these efforts have so far been fruitless. In other news, a vaccine to protect children against malaria has been greenlit by the World Health Organization, with recommendations to deploy the vaccine across sub-Saharan Africa and some other regions with high risks of malaria. This is of course rather massive news as there have been attempts to make a suitable malaria vaccine for over a century. It's believed that a vaccinated child population could prevent 40% of malaria cases and 30% of severe cases. Over 400,000 people a year die from malaria and so this could save a massive amount of lives. Up next is a very cool paper describing a fossil tardigrade from the Miocene that was preserved trapped in amber. This study explains how tardigrades, or water bears, have a long evolutionary history, diverging from other panarthropods sometime before the Cambrian period based on molecular clock analysis, and yet their fossil record is incredibly sparse, with only two Cretaceous fossils having been found before now. This amber discovery, the first tardigrade found from the Cenozoic, is described as a new genus and species, and the paper suggests that the rare fossil record of these animals is due to the preferential preservation of tardigrades in amber, added to the fact that fossil amber deposits are very scarce before the Cretaceous. So an absolutely amazing find, hopefully more fossil tardigrades will be found eventually. And now over to Ben, who, as you will see- Thanks Doug. Well, somehow we now have yet another newly named dinosaur this week, and once again it's from Britain. This is Pendrike milneray, a late Triassic aged coelophysoid theropod from a deposit in southern Wales. The name of this dinosaur comes from the Welsh for chief dragon, the anglicised form of which is also the name of King Arthur's father, Uther Pendragon. The species name, milneray, is named for Dr Angela Milner the co-describer of baryonyx and a key researcher of English dinosaurs and Mesozoic life, who sadly passed away not long ago. The recently described Spinosaurid Reparevenator Milneray was of course also named after her just last week, so it's nice to see her getting so much recognition for her work. Pendrike was found in a fissure fill deposit, and the remains of this animal comprise an articulated pelvic girdle, a sacrum, dorsal vertebrae, and a left femur in addition to some referred specimens including a single vertebra and a bit of a hip bone. The paper explains how there have been some recent suggestions that the animals found in late Triassic and early Jurassic fissure fill deposits might have been affected by insular dwarfism, and so they actually tested this idea for Pendrig itself. Looking at body size in early neotheropods, the study found that a reduced body size is unique to Pendrig, but also that certain other coelophysoids did show a similar reduction, meaning that there's some slight but ambiguous evidence supporting the idea that this newly named taxon did indeed experience dwarfism. So a great new dinosaur discovery that adds to our understanding of the Triassic world and early theropod evolution. Also in the news is a fascinating study that completely changes how we view the prehistoric giant ground sloths of the Americas. Until now, all extinct ground sloths had been considered to be purely herbivorous animals, due to the shape of their skulls and jaws, plus the fact that living sloth species are also herbivores. However, this new study has performed isotopic analyses of nitrogen of the specific amino acids recovered from bones of Darwin's ground sloth, Mylodon darwinii, discovering that it was actually an opportunistic omnivore. This means that the ecological structure of the prehistoric South American mammalian communities needs a re-evaluation, the study says considering the fact that sloths were a huge part of these for many millions of years. A very interesting study that also shows how useful interpretations of nitrogen isotopes can be in studying fossils. This definitely seems to indicate that we need to rethink giant ground sloths. Back to Doug in the studio. Thank you, Ben. Well, that's it for 7 Days of Science this week. I do hope you enjoyed, and hopefully, I'll see you next week. <laughs>